So um, the title is phenotyping, is it air or is it the key method in plant breeding? And uh, I like to give some of my ideas and uh, to say what is plant breeding about and plant breeding aims to improve the char characteristic of plants. So we want to improve all of our <coughs> uh, material uh, and uh, the short outline of my talk is given here. So I will give some uh, ideas about phenotyping and plant breeding, the, uh, what we think, uh, what we can do where, we, where phenotyping is helping. And then I want to present some cases of our work in the lab at, uh, and in campus. And of course, in one is of the drought stress and one is uh, or two of uh, farming system. So, oh, I have to go back a little bit. So I'm sorry for that. So usually we have the Breyer's equation. So the Breyer's equation tells us something about the response to selection. And I have to say that the selection is the main method for improving uh, plant populations. And uh, how, how can we uh, increase the response of selection? So it's uh, shortly, we can increase the intensity, the accuracy, and genetic differences. And uh, the first two parameters, intensity of accuracy, can be really improved by phenotyping. And uh, <clears throat> I like to go a little bit more in the formulas. And when we really have the response to selection, we think that we have a normal distributed uh, population and then we will select the best part of that. And then thereafter we have a new population and let's say that would be in the next generation. And then we recognize that the mean of the selection fraction is, is probably higher than the mean of the, in the next uh, uh, round or the next generation. And, uh, all these uh, differences between the original one and the new one is the response to selection and how can we calculate that? So the response to selection uh, the, is the uh, selection intensity times uh, square root of heritability and uh, square root of genetic uh, variance. And as I said, we, with phenotyping, we can uh, think about uh, higher selection intensity and heritability. And uh, how do we do that? How can we think about that? So when we think about the direct selection, uh, we can, uh, let's say, evaluate a, a lot of more genotypes with high throughput uh, systems and we can have automatization systems, robotic systems to uh, get the information from more genotypes and we can uh, probably increase the selection intensity. But also we can increase the heritability. Formally, the heritability is the uh, uh, ratio of genetic variance to phenotypic variance. But uh, when we have more objective data instead of the usual visually, uh, visual scoring, uh, we can increase the heritability and uh, maybe with uh, good phenotyping, we can reduce the error. We can use uh, better and higher plot sizes, plot and plot techniques and replication and so on. Um, another issue, and this has been really uh, stressed by the talk of Fabio, uh, we can think about an indirect selection. What does that mean? So we will not select for yield or drought tolerance itself. We will select for some of the traits which come from the lab. And uh, for that, of course, we have another formula. Uh, in that case, we would have uh, another uh, selection intensity, I dash as it's called, but this has to be higher than in the direct selection. That might be the case in some of the traits. Uh, when the direct selection is very complicated, very complicated to measure, but we can look for proxies which we can easily measure, then it would be a good idea to do so. 
all the heritability uh, might be higher in the uh, proxy than in the original um, trade. Then it might be interesting. Uh, however, as it is uh, said here, we have to have a genetic correlation. If we do not have a genetic correlation between the trade of interest and the proxy, we will not have any response of selection. And uh, you asked in the, or, or in the discussion a lot of uh, multi-trade uh, scenarios. Of course, we have a, a good uh, <coughs> theory about uh, multi-trades then we could do that for uh, index selection, but I wanted to make it very simple here. So now I like to give some case studies, which we did in the uh, several years ago or in the past. Uh, and in the first uh, case, it's about the drought stress. It's, uh, we think it's very important. And here we are combining the genotyping and, and phenotyping. So I don't have to say a lot of uh, drought. Even in Germany, we will recognize that we have uh, drought, and uh, the uh, <coughs> morning, the the soil moisture in the topsoil is lesser than before. And uh, when you have a look on the subsoil, we really have some areas, a lot of areas in Germany where we have extreme drought. So we think that drought is more and more important and we recognize in the last years that uh, drought is really severe in even in germany and therefore we thought it's a good idea to work with drought and how did we start that work so uh, we had a look on the in the literature and uh, the metabolite protein it has been reported to have adaptive functions uh, to, to different abiotic stresses and model plants like uh, Arabidopsis and so. And therefore, the, the question arises, what is the role of proline in barley? And uh, probably you know that uh, our, our model, which we are working, is uh, barley. And so we ask the question for barley. <clears throat> And now I have to say something about the plant breeding or the experiment in plant breeding. And uh, I have to <coughs> introduce the population. So uh, we really have to think about the population structure and how the population looks like. That means uh, in plant breeding, we really depend on population. So we, we might have crosses, biparental or multiparental crosses. We might have populations in hardy Weinberg equilibrium or association panels, which known genetic information or structure and, and the kinship in these association panels, or we might uh, evaluate uh, sets of relatives, etc. So that's very important for us to, to get the information out of the, out of the, or the, the set of uh, genotypes. So, uh, what did we do? And let's say uh, 20 years ago, we started uh, with a cross with a cultivar. It's a spring uh, barley cultivar. And we had the idea that we really have a huge amount of uh, alleles, which might uh, be positive, might be advantage, uh, have advantage, and from wild barley. So. Um, we cross them, of course, the wild barley has only has, has a lot of uh, bad uh, traits and has only, uh, let's say, yield of, of 20 or 15 percent of our uh, spring barley. So therefore, we had to follow the back crossing scheme. Uh, we took the F1 and, and crossed them to Scarlet again. We took uh, the first back cross and uh, crossed them again to Scarlet. And uh, with the B second back cross F1, we produced double haplot lines. So we produced around about more than 300 double haplot lines. That means we have had a population uh, for, uh, which are fully homozygous. So that is one of the start. And uh, look at this uh, graph here. Then we uh, thought about an introgression library from this population. And so I probably have to explain this graph. So what you are going to see here 
are the uh, seven chromosomes of uh, barley. And uh, when you see here a, rot, a, a red <coughs> fraction, that means that we have a small uh, fraction from the wild barley, which is introduced in a line of barley, but uh, the gray ones are the donor. So it's only a small fraction included in uh, one line. When you go for the second line, so these are the different lines we have. Uh, when you go to the second line, we have another uh, fragment of the wild barley, but it's not identical with the first one and so on. And the idea then is to introduce the whole genome in wild barley into different lines of uh, barley, but uh, most of the barleys should be uh, the scarlet and only a little tiny fragment of the uh, wild barley should be included so that we have access to the whole uh, wild barley, but in different lines. And that's uh, uh, basically shown with that uh, graph. Um, so <clears throat> then we uh, took the information that uh, proline might have an uh, effect on, on drought or on stress. And we tested uh, these uh, introgression line for an increase in proline. So, uh, and what you are going to see here is the outcome of four of these lines. I like to explain the graph again to you. What you see here in the, in the circle is that we have the first chromosome, the second chromosome, and so forth from Bali. And whenever you have a blue uh, segment, that means that we have the uh, scarlet here. And whenever we have a red, a dot red uh, uh, fragment, that means that here we do have a segment from our uh, wild form. And uh, then we concentrated on two of the lines which really show a high proline uh, after uh, stress. And these are these two, two lines which are given here. And especially this is the A and B genotypes. And you see two other lines um, which have no increase in proline. And then you can recognize that in both lines we have a small segment, small, small, small segment which comes from our wild form. And in that case, we have a higher proline. So then we thought, okay, that might be a good indication. And uh, <clears throat> then here you see the increase in proline uh, for stress and control. And here is our cultivated type. Two other types, we have an increase uh, in stress for proline, but when you see these two lines, which we are interested in, we have a huge increase in proline and it's comparable to the one uh, in our wild form. And here you see uh, the images of these <coughs> measurements. So now we have the idea that we know about the region where the gene of interest is. And now we wanted to really uh, look for the gene of interest. That means from the introgression line, we wanted to see, uh, can we identify the candidate gene? So I like to explain this uh, graph to you. <coughs> Here we do have in the same colors, the um, uh, scarlet and uh, in, in red, the, the wild form introgression into our two lines, which I have explained before. And here in, we have the small region in which both of these lines have uh, the uh, common, uh, common fragment of the wild form. And then we were looking and, and constructing genetic markers for the left and the right border. And then uh, we had an idea of a candidate gene and there we, we constructed a marker for the left and right borders and two markers inside of our candidate gene. 
and uh, then we tested uh, several thousand of recombinants. So we did another uh, round of uh, crossing and tested several thousand of uh, uh, yeah, offspring and uh, analyzed the one. And we, here we were really interested in the ones which are uh, uh, would show a recombination in, in this small, tiny region. Here is the outcome. Again, the red one is the wild form, the blue one is the cultivated form. And uh, when you see a difference, uh, then we have a recombination in that region. So I like to <coughs> give, go on to this uh, column, which is the most interesting part. So whenever we have a wild form, in this promoter region, we can, could recognize that we have an increase in proline when at that point we had heterozygous genotypes. Uh, we had not that uh, increase as in the, from the wild form and uh, the cultivated form, we do, did not have a huge increase. So that it's another indication that this uh, small region or the promoter of these candidate gene is relevant for our uh, work and uh, then we tested these genotypes in a rain out shelter. So in the rain out shelter of Campus Klein Altendorf we are able to have uh, normal soil but without rain and uh, of course all of these experiments are mirrored so outside we have the same experiment under rain-fed conditions. That's uh, usual what we do in the rain-out uh, shelter. And we tested this line here. And uh, I like to uh, give some of these uh, results. Uh, we have an increase in grain number when you have a look on the drought uh, scenario. So from Scarlet and uh, from our line. Uh, so we have an increase in grain number we have an increase in grain weight per plant under drought. And uh, here you see we have quite a huge increase, of course, and that's, uh, I would say, normal. Outside, uh, under control, uh, we have a higher um, <coughs> grain weight per plant. But under drought, uh, we had a yeah, beneficial effect of this, uh, this allele. And the same was true for 1,000 uh, grain weight. And uh, we will repeat this experiment this year. So one of the issues in plant breeding is that we often have not enough seeds. So in that uh, experiment, we had only, let's say, uh, 60 or 70 seeds of this line. And now uh, the experiment is repeated in uh, Klein Altendorf. And now we have uh, several thousand seeds and have uh, bigger plot sizes with that. But we did some other experiment in the greenhouse. And here you see, and, and uh, as we were very interested in this line, we constructed the backcroft six. That means really only uh, the small, small fragment is included. The other uh, chromosomes and other uh, are um, from scarlet. So we compared this uh, line with the scarlet and you will see after six, uh, 12 days without watering, um, the plants looks almost dead. And the same was true for our line. But after rewatering, after rewatering, you will see here that we have really an improvement due to this, uh, to this uh, allele. And of course, we think that this is only, it's just one of the strategies and uh, we do have different strategies which we can find in the plants, but it's one, I would say, tiny puzzle piece to improve our uh, yeah, drought uh, tolerance of the plants. So I like to continue with uh, two other studies and uh, it's a combination of plant breeding and farming systems. And um, here we go into the field. And genotype by management interaction is a huge uh, point uh, which we uh, address in the first and then we have a long-term selection 
experiment. But start, let's start with the genotype by management interaction in an experiment for winter wheat. In that experiment, together with other groups in Germany, <coughs> we had a, a huge trial on, on uh, several locations in all over, not all over, but, but in, in the uh, most part of Germany and in different, in Kiel, in Quedlinburg, Hannover, Bonn, Rausch, Holzhausen, and Groß-Gerau, and uh, we have different soil types, etc. And uh, that's in every of these locations, we tested the uh, genotypes or cultivars in that point for different uh, management systems. So we had a low input, a semi-intensive and intensive system. In the uh, low input system, we had a reduced uh, nitrogen fertilizer. In uh, semi-intensive and intensive, we had <coughs> the same aim to have 220 kilogram per hectare. And we had uh, two different uh, or steps in the factor of fungicide and insecticide. We have no fungicides in the low input system, no is a semi-intensive and we do have uh, fungicides and insecticides as normal in the intensive system. And we tested round about 220 wheat uh, cultivars for these two, uh, three um, management system in seven uh, um, locations. So it's a quite a huge uh, study. And I like to give some of the results, which you can see here. Uh, again, I like to explain the graph. So we will see at, in that case only the grain yield. And um, these 200 genotypes were uh, selected for different uh, days of release. That means in, in uh, self-pollinating crops, you can take the old and the new varieties and you, you can test them under today's uh, um, locations and uh, management systems. That means we tested some genotypes from uh, the 60s, some from the 70s and so on, and the newest uh, genotypes were released in uh, 2015. So that means here we can see the increase in yield uh, due to breeding. And uh, here you can see an increase in the uh, uh, intensive um, management system. And when we compare the, uh, the system to the uh, system without fungicides, we do see that we have a lower yield uh, as we allow uh, the, the plant diseases. But uh, again, we have an increase in the yield um, for in the last decades. And uh, when you go for the last uh, sign here, we, here we have uh, or mimic something like an organic system and we have no fungicides, no insecticides, and uh, reduced uh, nitrogen. And again, we have a lower yield, but as you can see here, uh, we still have an increase. Still, the new varieties are better than the old varieties. And maybe you have read in the newspaper that the old varieties are very much adapted to low, uh, low, uh, input uh, systems, we were not able to find this finding here in our experiment. Here, I, uh, due to uh, time reasons, I cannot go that much in, uh, in the explanation. Here we have the haplotypes, and uh, you will see that the more or less negative haplotypes, which have been evaluated your genotyping, uh, are reduced but uh, still we have some haplotypes which are not beneficial. So for the future, we expect that we can increase the yield further on. So uh, that's one of the issue um, with plant breeding and uh, management systems, but we had uh, other ideas and I like to go to a long-term selection 
study which we uh, are doing in Klein Altendorf. And there we have a long-term selection under organic and conventional farming system. That means we have uh, quite different uh, questions and uh, I like to uh, give some of the questions here. Um, do or does long-term selection uh, under different farming system lead to changes in allele frequencies? So are there specific alleles that give an advantage of the genotypes grown under these particular related uh, conditions? And in this specific uh, case, we introduce wild form, wild form genotypes, uh, alleles which are not present in our elite material. And we wanted to ask whether we can improve our uh, resources by introducing different genetic resources. And are these probably um, yeah, better under organic conditions? So therefore we started in the mid of 90s uh, experiment and we established several population of barley, wheat and all seed. And uh, we cross all of them with wild form material. Uh, in Bali, it was quite easy to uh, <coughs> find wild form material. In wheat, we took synthetic weeds. And in all seed rape, we also took uh, synthetic uh, all seed rape, uh, which uh, contain different alleles, not in, which are not in the elite, elite material. We constructed four population for each crop, and uh, they have been grown under conventional and organic farming system for more than two decades. And I like to give an overview about this experiment, which stands in Klein Altendorf at the moment. And as you can see here in the organic system, we have a crop rotation with seven crops. And you can see in the uh, um, um, yellow box, we have much more space for the organic system. And we do have all these four populations here and uh, we only have organic fertilizers and we have no plant protection and uh, what is uh, very interesting for us the organic system and the and the uh, red box the conventional system are side by side so we do not have any differences in soil we do not have any differences in weather so every uh, side effects which you usually have when you go to different uh, farmers are not present here. And here in the conventional system, we have uh, three crops. It's uh, the mentioned one, barley, barley, wheat, and uh, rapeseed, and uh, are standing here in the red box. So um, this is an actual image of this experiment uh, from the 5th of May, a few days ago. Uh, you can look at that in uh, Klein Altendorf. And uh, <coughs> here you, it is shown that we have two different leaves of the same initial population. And here you see really tiny differences in, in the color. So we have a lighter green in the organic system. We have a darker green in the conventional system. But we think that these differences um, might accumulate during the long-term selection period. So we have uh, now over 20 years and uh, we might see the differences that uh, in an organic system we have a lower access to nitrogen. This nitrogen availability will come later in the year and that might uh, cause some, some uh, selection response in the um, population. So what we did we do? And uh, from the initial barley population, we analyzed approximately 900 plants for each farming system. So it's quite a lot. And that for five generations um, uh, for out of these 20 generations. Um, and we took the whole genome sequencing technique as we are really interested in allele uh, frequency changes. And of course, further uh, studies are going on. And I 
Uh, we have not published that yet, but I wanted to present the first uh, results of these uh, experiments to you. Um, it looks like uh, what you're going to see here, it looks like a normal Manhattan plot, but it is not, it is not allowed to, uh, to explain. So we have the initial population here and we do have the uh, chromosomes in uh, different colors, the seven chromosomes of uh, Bali. But here we do have the uh, frequency, the LA frequency of the wild types which are present. So with our breeding scheme, we had the aim that uh, about 12 and a half percent of the wild form is included. It's uh, when you look at the mean, we are pretty proud to have that, of course, in, uh, in that uh, chromosome 5H in that uh, region, we have a lesser extent, but uh, uh, on, in the mean, we are quite uh, fine with the initial population. And um, then we look at what has happened during the 20 years of, gener of generations under conventional farming system and 20 generations of organic farming system. And here you clearly see that when you compare these conventional farming system and the organic farming system, that the allele frequency really is different. So we have an increase more or less so from, from the first uh, uh, image, you can see that we have an increase in the wild form alleles compared to uh, the um, uh, conventional system. It might be that we need other alleles in the uh, organic system than in the, in the uh, conventional system where we have uh, nitrogen, uh, unlimited and where we have insecticide and where we have uh, fungicides. Um, going into detail and having a look at, at uh, one of these chromosomes, the chromosome 3H, and uh, here we see a little bit more in detail that we really have an increase uh, in the organic system at some of these regions, you can see here. And uh, in the uh, conventional system, we did not found, uh, find this uh, increase. So now our task is to ask, why is it so? Which candidate genes are important? Which phenotypes are important? And um, which uh, alleles drive, uh, drives the fitness for the different farming systems? Are we able to find the candidate genes? And uh, for this talk, uh, which phenotypic traits are involved and which uh, phenotypic traits uh, differ, especially between the farming system. And therefore we are just, and that's a um, image uh, from, from the 5th May again. Uh, therefore we have an experiment in Klein Altendorf where we test around about 1000 uh, genotypes of this experiment and 500 of them are coming from the organic and 500 of them are coming from the conventional system and they are uh, created and they are shown side by side. And uh, now we, we will evaluate which difference do we have for the organic system and for the conventional system. So, and I like to stress that the initial population 20 years ago was, was uh, the same. So it's from the initial uh, population. And here we will analyze the, um, in, a, in a master thesis, so the root system, which uh, changes do we have in the root system for around about 100 uh, genotypes. We will measure the phenotypic and genotypic variances with different sensor systems and we will see whether we do have a difference. And uh, we, of course, we, we are looking for obvious differences, maybe just by looking and, and looking for new, new traits. So with that, I like to thank you for the attention and I like to thank uh, my group for the whole work. So my group is, uh, we have some, people working with phenotyping, some with molecular breeding and uh, some with quantitative genetics. So I like to 
say that Ali Nas was responsible and, and Aziz are responsible for the uh, work on the drought tolerance. Uh, Agim Balbora, um, Benedict, uh, Said, um, Salma, and um, <coughs> Nuri Lam is responsible for the work with the Brevix population, which has been published already. And Agim Balbora and uh, Michael Schneider are responsible for the um, the system with the organic and the conventional system. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the attention.